Thank you, Brother Wade. Boy, that was tremendous, wasn't it? This has been a tremendous lectureship from my observation. Uh, I've just gained so much from it, and I want to express my appreciation to Brother Michael, Brother Darrell, for uh, the work which they have done in the Sunny Slope congregation and uh, the other congregations that have cooperated with them for this lectureship. Uh, it has just been a tremendous weekend. Uh, my wife and I have thoroughly enjoyed it, and I want you to know uh, how much I appreciate the invitation that you have extended to me to be with you uh, in this lectureship. It's always a pleasure, always a joy uh, to come and be with you. And I, I'm, I'm just thrilled at this opportunity. Uh, I don't know about anyone else, but I, I tell you, I've taken lots of notes uh, and uh, it's just been a great benefit to me and I want to thank you very much. Sometimes things get all messed up. Um, thought about the fellow, he owned a company and he had a project that had to get out. He just needed it, needed to get it out. Uh, he couldn't delay any longer and he asked his secretary, he said, would you mind staying over this evening and help me finish this up uh, because I've got to get it done today. And she said, well, uh, I, if I do, I'll miss my bus uh, going home. And he said, well, I'll take you home. I'll, I'll, I'll take you after, if you can stay and work with me uh, till we get this done, then I'll take you home. So she said, well, okay. So she stayed and helped him get the project out. And sure enough, when he got through, uh, he, he took her home. Uh, nothing, there was no kind of, a, any kind of a sexual problem or uh, he wasn't interested, wasn't, but he just, he took her home after work so she wouldn't uh, have, have to walk, she missed her bus. So he goes home and as soon as he pulls in the driveway, his wife comes and she said, look, I am worn out, let's go out and eat dinner this evening. He said, oh, okay. So she gets in the car and they're driving and, and as he's driving now, his wife, she's kind of probably a little bit on the jealous nature, you know, and uh, so at any rate, but he looks over and in the floorboard of the front, he sees a shoe. He thought, oh my goodness. And so he got his wife, his wife's attention and kind of got her looking out the window. And he reached over real quick and he grabbed that shoe and opened his window down and threw it out the window. They got to the restaurant, got out of the car. She gets out, but before she does, she's looking around. She said, hey, I've lost my shoe. I can't find my shoe. He had thrown it out the window. So you just do not know what's going to take place uh, when, you, when you think about what happens. And you and I, as we've had this opportunity to study the Bible together, it has just been a great opportunity. If you have a song book, that song, I don't know, you've got two song books in the front there or in the pew. I want to turn to 100, I'm not going to lead a song, don't worry about it. I am not going to lead a song. Uh, 120, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Now look at this chorus. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. In Matthew chapter number 7, Jesus made this statement. He said, Not every man that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he which doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will come to me in that day and they say, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name and in thy name cast out demons and in thy name do many wonderful works. And I will say unto them, depart from me, you cursed in the everlasting fire prepared. They had not done his will. And our Lord gives a lesson there, and he said that a man builds a house upon the rock, and the rains descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew, and beat on the house, and it stood because it was founded upon a rock. And then he said, there are those who build their house upon the sand. And the Bible says that the rains come, the wind blow, and beat on that house, 
and it fell because it was founded upon the sand. You and I look at our life. Jesus made this statement in John 10, verse number 10. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and might have it more abundantly. Many individuals have built their life upon the sand. All other ground is sinking sand. For an example, let me just give you two or three illustrations here to help you and I understand uh, there is a sinking sand. For an example, if you build your life on immorality, you're building your life on a sinking sand. The book of Galatians, the Bible tells us, Galatians uh, chapter number 5, verses 19 through 21, the Bible says, The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, fornication, lasciviousness, uncleanness. And he goes through a whole list of things. And if you build your life on those things, then, my friend, you're building on seeking sand. Colossians chapter number 3, the Bible says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the throne of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. You are dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. And the Bible says, When he shall come, he is our life, then we shall sit with him or we shall uh, joy with him when he comes again. We'll, he will bring us with him. Then the Bible says this, Mortify therefore your members which are upon this earth. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. He talks about idolatry in Galatians, and witchcraft and variance and hatred and strife. Ladies and gentlemen, those things are sinking sand. If you go to Romans chapter number 1 and you read verses 18 through verse number 32, it's sinking sand. And when you and I look out at the world and we see the world and we see how that the world is building its life on immorality, ladies and gentlemen, it's sinking sand. Those individuals who build their life on a false doctrine are building their life on sinking sand. Second Peter chapter number 2, the Bible says, There were false prophets among the people, even as there shall also be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord which bought them, and shall bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You're building your life on sinking sand when you build it on false doctrine. In the book of Galatians chapter number one, Paul said this. He said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Paul said, do I seek now to please men or God? If you're building your life on a false doctrine, then you're building your life on sinking sand. Matthew chapter number 7, verse 13, you remember that uh, Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat, but straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he said this, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, he said, they're ravening wolves. Are you building your life on false doctrine? Are you building your life on immorality? Are you building your life on the idea that now I, I'm, you know, with the group that we have here today, I'm sure this is not true. But there are those who have no respect for God. For an example, in the book of Luke, chapter number 16, verses 19 through 31, the Bible says there was a certain rich man clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. More of the dogs came and licked his sores. The Bible says it came to pass that the beggar died, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. He seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. 
And he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. Oh, Abraham said, Son, remember. Rememberst thou in thy lifetime thou receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. He said, besides this, there's a great gulf fix. Here's the point I want you and I to understand. The rich man had built his life on sinking sand. It had no purpose for him when this life was over. So an individual may build their life on immorality. An individual may build their life on a false doctrine. An individual may build his life on uh, sinking sand by refusing to be obedient to the will of God. You may be building your life on lukewarmness. Many members of the church, their, their idea is, well, uh, I'll be a pew filler and a bench warmer, and so their Christianity, it's just a It's kind of like a coat. Years ago, now, we don't, probably don't do this as much. I remember my dad. My dad would buy two suits a year, one for the spring, one for the summer. He only wore them on Sunday. He never, he never wore those suits any other time. And so on Sunday, when it was time to go to, to Bible study and to worship, uh, my dad would put his suit on and he would go to the services. There are a lot of individuals who wear the religious suit on Sunday. But in the book of Revelation, chapter number three, the Bible said, I would thou were hot or cold. But because thou art lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So you and I need to recognize that if we build our life on sinking sand, the sinking sand of immorality or the sinking sand of false doctrine or the sinking sand of not obeying God or the sinking sand of lukewarmness, then you and I are going to sink. I want this afternoon and the final few minutes of this lectureship. I want to suggest four anchors for us so that we don't find ourselves on sinking sand. In the book of Acts, chapter number 27, you remember that Paul, that they, I mean, he's going to Rome, they have a shipwreck. And the Bible says that they dropped four anchors. I remember reading about Booker T. Washington. This took place uh, in 1895 in Atlanta, Georgia. It was called the uh, Atlanta Conference. And in that particular conference, Booker T. And, and as the story goes, it was really the, 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 the time that set Booker T. Washington uh, as a spokesman. But he, he related a, a interesting uh, illustration. And he said there was a ship and, and there was a, they noticed a friendly ship. And the ship that was coming, they began to flash, water, water, we, we, we need water, water. And so the friendly ship sent a message back, drop your bucket where you are. And they again sent a message, water, water, we, we need water, we, we're, we're thirsty, we need water. And they again, the second time, sent the message, drop your bucket where you are. Well, that went on a third time. Finally, the fourth time, they got this message, you know, drop your bucket where you are. And when they dropped their bucket, they brought up clear, sparkling, fresh water because they were at the edge of the Amazon River. And they had that water. So many individuals are dropping their bucket in the wrong place. I thought about, uh, oh, this happened in 2009, just off the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, four men, three, I think two of them uh, were National League football players. One had played in high school. Uh, a fellow named William Bleakley, I believe it was. Uh, Marquise Cooper, uh, Nick Schuler, Corey Smith, these four men. And they had gone out fishing. They had left about 5.30 that morning. Uh, they had gone out fishing, and all of a sudden in the evening, uh, a storm began to arise. And so they thought, well, we need to get back to shore. And so when they began to try to pull up that anchor, it wouldn't come up. It, they couldn't, it was hung. They couldn't get it. 
And so whoever was driving the boat, I don't remember, but anyway, whoever's just, you know how you'd gun it. They thought, okay, we're going to gun it and then, of course, jerk the anchor up. And when they did, instead of jerking the anchor up, it flipped the boat. Three of those men died. After several hours, many, I think about 48 hours, maybe even longer than that, they finally, Nick Schuler was finally rescued. He wrote a book about that. But when you and I see again that here they had, they had those anchors, but they, when, when they gunned that thing, those anchors didn't hold. I read about, a, I guess this back in 1979, Hurricane David. Hurricane was coming in. These guys, they had this barge. They were tying it down. Man, they had ropes. It looked like a spider web. And an old Navy guy, an old guy that had been out on the ocean many times, he came by and he said, fellas, let me tell you something. When that storm comes with what you've got here, that boat's going to be destroyed. Let me tell you what to do. You just kind of let it drift out a little bit. You put down four anchors, leave them loose, and then pray that things will go well. That's what they did. My friend, listen today. Is your life, is my life built on sinking sand? All other ground is sinking sand. Let me give you four things. Number one, and that is anchor your life. Let purpose be one of the anchors of your life. You have a purpose. Luke chapter number two and verse number 49. You remember what Jesus said on that occasion? Uh, he had been in the temple. His parents said, you know, they missed him. They'd gone out a day's journey, come back. They find him in the temple. And here's what our Lord said. Wished you not that I must be about my father's business. He had a purpose. If you go to the book of Matthew chapter number 25, and you begin reading at verse number 14, and read through down verse number 30. There was a man with five talent, two and one talent. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, the man with five gained five more than the brother with two gained two more than the one with one. Oh, I was afraid. And I buried that talent. You see, folks, if you and I in life, if you and I in Christianity, that we have our life, if it's anchored to the purpose that God has, every man, woman, boy, and girl, has an ability, has a purpose that can be fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Folks, this idea, somebody said, have you ever thought about this? Uh, I was telling uh, some folks today, we, we, my wife and I have got to watching birds. Uh, you know, when you get my age, these little birds go through your mind, you pick one of them out, but that's a different bird. But at any rate, uh, we got to watching birds. And when you think about purpose and when you think about the fact that that is is there some purpose in life my friend you think about this you can take a duck you can take a duck and you can you can take that duck and you can put that duck on a pond now you can't see this good but man he is paddling like crazy under that but you know he's just gliding Softly across that pond. We have squirrels. I was telling someone, these squirrels, they, they are literally eating the vinyl siding off my house. Now, I like squirrels. But I'm going to tell you, so you, you watch those squirrels, and I have to put, I have a pole where I have a bird feeders, and I have to put grease on that pole to keep those squirrels from getting the bird feed. I'm telling you, we've got trees all around, and these squirrels, they just go up. Watch this. You can take that old squirrel and take him out on a pond, and you put him out on a pond, and I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, that squirrel's going to sink on that pond. He's not going to be like a duck floating on that pond. You can take that duck, and you can set that duck in front of a, a, a tree, and you can say, you got to climb that tree and get hickory nuts. That duck is, I'm telling you, those web feet and that beak, it is not going to climb that tree and get hickory nuts. Now, what is the point? 
Every man, woman, boy, and girl has an ability in the kingdom of God. Is your life, is my life anchored with a purpose? In Jeremiah 1 verse number 5, God said, Jeremiah, I've got a purpose. I knew you in the womb. Let me give you the second one. Courage. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 31, Moses writes, he's ready to die. The children of Israel are ready to go into the promised land. Moses writes to them and he says, you be strong and of good courage. Twenty-five times in the Bible that I found, be strong and of good courage or similar words are found. When you and I look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the Bible says, Therefore be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In 1 Chronicles 28, uh, David said to his son Solomon, he said, You be of good courage, don't be afraid, be not dismayed. You know what David said? God's going to be with you. When you and I study the Holy Scriptures and we find out, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you have a Bible, there's a ver I want you to go to Philippians chapter number 1. There's a, a word there in verse number 28. Philippians chapter number 1 and verse number 28. Notice what the Bible says. I like the wording of this. Paul says, in nothing, and in nothing, terrified by your adversaries. Do not, and I think as we have listened to these messages this weekend on higher ground, on standing firm on higher ground, that ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon, that as you and I conclude this, that Paul says to those Philippian brethren, don't you be terrified. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Paul said to these Philippians, don't you be terrified. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, if God be for us, who can be again? I love, oh, I love every one of those illustrations you got. I mean, I loved, I loved David. There's a statement in 1 Samuel 17. David said, is there not a cause? Ladies and gentlemen, you and I, if we're going to not be on sinking sand and we're going to have the right anchor. We want the anchor of purpose and we want the anchor of courage. Let me give you a third one. We want the anchor of worship. Now the Bible teaches us uh, when you and I go to John 4 and verse number 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You and I need the anchor of worship, ladies and gentlemen. You know, in Psalm 42, verse number 1, and well, we've had some great lessons today from Psalm. And the psalmist said, As the heart panteth for the water, my soul panteth after thee. Worship. I want you to think about something. In the book of Acts, chapter number 8, the Bible tells you, go down about verse number 26 and read through down verse number 33, the Bible tells us about the Ethiopian eunuch. Great lessons there. Most of the time, which is rightly so, we're gonna, we'll go down and we'll focus on the statement in which uh, the eunuch said, Do you see here is water? What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest, thou mayest. He said, I believe Jesus Christ, Son of God. They commanded the chariot to stand still. They both went down the water, both felt in the eunuch, and he baptized him. But when you back up, the Bible tells us that here was a man from Ethiopia. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Have you ever thought about that? A man from Ethiopia had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Now, that is 1,500 miles one way. 1,500 miles one way. 
I, I kind of calculated out if you went from Canada down to Mexico, it was about 2,200 miles. Uh, I think if you went from the East Coast to the West Coast, you're probably looking at somewhere around 2,800, 2,900 miles. This man, now watch this, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says that he went, he, he went from Ethiopia to Jerusalem and back. And that's 3,000 miles to worship. Now, I'm going to tell you, my wife and I drove up here from Atlanta. Riley drove up here from uh, Savannah. Wade flew up here from Houston. And we got here in less than a day. Now you get in a chariot, you get yourself in a chariot and you ride 1,500 miles in a chariot. Ladies and gentlemen, worship is vital to us. When you and I, we see that, we, that anchor, and I'm sure that it, all of us have seen again uh, the, the difficulty. And, and, you know, some of our brethren, I mean, they're probably not coming back to worship. But the point I'm trying to help you and I see that, that the anchor, ladies and gentlemen, is not just an anchor of purpose or do we not have just an anchor of courage, but we have an anchor of worship because as we come together, we find ourselves encouraged. Several years ago, and I'll be through, what, 4 o'clock this afternoon. I know, it's, but I'll be through in just a minute. Several years ago. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, if you want to know how to go broke in any business, call me up. I know how to do it. I'm telling you, I know how to do it. We were in a business, and I mean, it was bleeding money. But let me tell you that. Two greatest days of the week to my wife and I during this time was Wednesday night and Sunday. You know why? Because we were able to assemble together with the brethren and be built up. It's an anchor. Let me give you the fourth one. We have the anchor of purpose. We have the anchor of courage. We have the anchor of worship. And then number four, there is the anchor of the church. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are part of this body. In Ephesians chapter number four, you know, the Bible says there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father is above all through all and in you all. The church. The Bible said in Acts chapter number two, we don't have time to go through all this. In Acts chapter number 2, there were 3,000 who were baptized that day. 3,000. And the Bible says in verse number 47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved by those that were being saved. Here were 3,000 people. Now, a lot of things took place here. You know, in Acts chapter number 6, the Grecian widows were being neglected in the daily ministry. You know what they did? They selected men to take care of that. Why was that taking place? Because the church had been established. And here's what happened. Many of these folks, ladies and gentlemen, many of these folks, they had come, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, and Cappadocia, Pont. they had all come to Jerusalem. Now they are a part of the church. And we don't want to go home. And it wasn't until Acts chapter number 8, listen to this, they therefore that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. You got all these people together, the church. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an anchor for the soul. When you and I look at sinking sand, the immorality of sinking sand, or lukewarmness, or false doctrine, or refusing God. And then we look at these anchors of purpose, of courage, of worship in the church. Ladies and gentlemen, then we remember 1 Corinthians 15, 24. The Bible says, then the end shall come when he shall have delivered up the kingdom unto God, even the Father. My question is now, are you a part of that kingdom? Are you a part of that church? 
Are you a part of that worship? Are you a part of it? If not, then we would encourage you through faith. Make a change in your life. Repent of your sins. That's, you know, repentance is a change. You're going in one direction. I'm going to turn around and go in another one. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ before men. Be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Maybe you've done that, but to this afternoon, you've come to the conclusion, look, I need to rededicate myself to the cause of God. I, I, need, I need to remember that purpose, and I re need to remember that courage, and I need to see that worship, and I'm a part of the church. If we can help you in any way, will you come now while we stand and sing this invitation song?